everyone. Um, so I'll start off by talking about a few best practices. This is definitely not anything formal. We kind of put this together based on our experiences, some things that our collaborators told us that helped them for their specifics. So feel free to stop me anytime if you have questions, if you want to add to the suggestions uh, for maybe like next year's participants. So that would be really appreciated as well. So I'll go ahead and get started. So what I'll do in this talk is first I'll go through these tips for developing uh, labeling functions and then I'll spend some time talking about, as Joey said, some of the other work that we're doing in Chris's lab around this idea of weak supervision and especially some tools and some algorithms that help you write more labeling functions as well as kind of get more out of the labeling functions that you've already written in an automated fashion. So we'll go through those. Um, we'll also love to hear from you like what you think would be really important while you're writing labeling functions. So maybe that'll inspire us to do our next project. And then I'll you left some time for discussion, but if you guys ask questions during uh, the talk, that, that's fine as well. So starting with refining and writing labeling functions. So I think when I joined lab, which was around two years ago, this is when Snorkel was just starting. So I was like one of the guinea pigs for writing labeling functions in Snorkel. Uh, and I thought it was just like a crazy art. You just had to have practice with it to know how to write it properly. I didn't know what metric I was supposed to use. I didn't know, you know, like, where do I start? Should I just go broad and then go narrow? Should I go narrow, then go broad? But I think m the more practice I had with it, I talked to people who had used it before, and there were, there were certain signals that you could kind of systematically use to help develop your labeling functions. So hoping to share that with you today. So the first thing that we want to look at before we start writing these labeling functions is how do we really define a good labeling function? And what is success in this whole idea of writing labeling functions and doing weak supervision? So I think one of the things is, you know, the labeling function itself. You usually have access to the small labeled development set. It is really small, but those are the ones you actually have ground truth labels for. And that's the one that helps you kind of refine what you're uh, working on, kind of make those little tweaks to your existing labeling functions. So that's the first way I would define success. It's just, you know, writing your labeling function and then evaluating it on your small labeled set to see if it's doing well or not, what its coverage is, what its accuracy is. We'll talk about this a bit more in detail later, but also how it's conflicting with other existing labeling functions. The second way to measure success is looking at the generative model performance. So now that you've written all your labeling functions, you put all this data into the generative model, which then combines them, learns their accuracies, their dependencies, and then assigns these labels at the end, right? And that's what we care about because that's what we're going to use as our training data. So the second way of measuring success is looking at these labels, again, on your small development set. But that can give you hints about once you wrote a new labeling function or refined an existing one, how did it interact with the rest of them? So the first step is very narrow because you're just focusing on that one labeling function. The second step is a little broader because now you've taken into account its relation with other labeling functions and you can actually see the quality of the relation of uh, the quality of the labels that you're assigning the final labels. Finally, I didn't highlight this one, but it's obviously training your end model. You know, you're going through this whole exercise of weak supervision writing labeling functions because you want to train a complex end model. So that can also be done. One of the drawbacks of training this model and kind of using it as a tool to debug is that it's slow, right? You have to, every time you retrain it, it can take a couple of minutes. Sometimes in cases with a large amount of data, it can take a couple of hours. So kind of keep that in mind as that is something you can definitely look at. But I would definitely use, you know, the labeling function level and the generative model level to kind of do the quick iterative process. One of the advantages, yeah, question. Is the difference between overlap and conflict? That's a great question. So overlap is how, um, how many data points on uh, which the two labeling functions have both assigned a label to. And conflict is among the ones that they actually overlap on or they have both labeled, which ones do they disagree on? 
One other point that I wanted to add about the discriminative model is that it sort of gives you additional signal that the labeling functions and the generative model doesn't. So with the discriminative model, you're finally using the assigned labels to your large training set and then training some end model. So you can, the discriminative model is the only way for you to kind of see indirectly what the quality of those uh, labels are. For labeling function and generative model, you keep evaluating on your small dev set. So the only way you can kind of go beyond that small dev set is looking at the discriminative model. So now we're going to go through some of these tips. Some of them are really obvious. I'll try to make them, you know, try to add something new to them, which is just like, oh, yeah, I knew this already. Of course, I'll write all the labeling functions. Um, so here I'm going to go through examples with the spouse data set, which is the more boring data set, I know, but it's also easier to write examples for. Um, so let's say we have the sentence that you know, says that person A and person B are married. That seems to be you know, one of those really obvious examples. And we can write a labeling function for that, saying you know, if the word and appears in between the people names, and if the word married appears later. So you would think that, you know, hopefully in, among the sentences we're looking at, this kind of occurs a lot. But what you actually see is that it has fairly low coverage. Like it has around 0.2% coverage, which is really low. And its empirical accuracy is also not that great. So if you were just looking at this table and you didn't know what the different labeling functions were, you would probably just drop this one because you would say that, look, the empirical accuracy is like really bad. The coverage is also one of the lowest ones in this entire table. So why do we even need it? But with your knowledge of the task and kind of your domain knowledge itself, you know that even though from this table it looks like it's not important, it's actually encoding a very important signal. Saying that person A and person B are married is probably one of those obvious signals that you do want to encode in your labeling functions. Another thing that I want to highlight is, again, the coverage and the empirical accuracy is, again, on your small dev set. So you don't know, you know what the coverage or the accuracy could be on your large, much larger training set. So that's also something to keep in mind, that this is always giving you sort of an incomplete picture of what your labeling function is doing. So I think the takeaway from this is like trust your gut and your domain knowledge rather than you know kind of this table. So you know that encoding something, a sentence structure like that is important, so keep it, even if it seems like, you know, in the table, this might be the worst labeling function. What's the learned accuracy? Right, so the learned accuracy is the accuracy that the generative model learns, and this is when it's, um, you put all the labels from all the different labeling functions into the generative model. So the second thing among you know, writing as many labeling functions as possible is something on the other side. Now we go from a labeling function that was very specific, didn't really have that high coverage, to one that's really broad and has one of the highest coverages, like by a lot. This is covering 62% of the dev set. So what is this labeling function doing? It's basically looking at whether a spouse word appears in the sentence or not. And if it doesn't, it says, you know, this sentence does not have any um, marriage relation in it. But one thing to note here is this is definitely something that when you think about it, you'll be like, okay, this is so obvious. Do I even need to encode it? Maybe it won't do really well. But in this case, looking at this table helps you see that the coverage is really high. And the empirical accuracy is like crazy. Like 96%, that's pretty great. One of the things, though, to notice here is even though it has great empirical accuracy and great coverage, it's only labeling negative examples. So if you just write all your labeling functions that are like this, but they all just label negative examples, you're never going to have any positive examples. There's going to be no signal to encode that. So I think this kind of talks about this trade-off between accuracy and coverage, which I'll talk a little bit more about later as well. But you have to make sure while you're writing your labeling function, you kind of evenly uh, support both categories in a binary case. You know, even though it might be a lot easier to label negatives, you need to still write, you know, maybe small narrow labeling functions that still account for the positives. So the second thing is, don't be afraid of conflict. So before I go into this, how many people were actually looking at that conflicts column when they were writing their labeling functions? 
one. Okay, so not, not really. Um, so I think this the conflicts column is really interesting because that's exactly what the generative model uses to learn accuracies for the different labeling functions. If you had all of these labeling functions that never conflicted with each other, there would be no signal for the generative model to actually learn something. You know, learn like, oh yeah, this one conflicts with labeling function one, conflicts with labeling function two a lot, you know, so that means one of them is really accurate and one of them is not accurate. So if you don't have conflicts, you're kind of hurting your generative model more in terms of learning these good accuracies. So what I was going to highlight here is, you know, if you look at the husband-wife labeling function, you see that its conflicts are almost around 30% um, of all the overlaps it has. So whenever it labels something that another labeling function has labeled, 30% of the time it disagrees with the other ones. This seems crazy, and if, well, you guys aren't looking at the conflict column, but if you were, you would say this is bad, and this is a really bad labeling function. But it's OK, because again, it looks at a really key uh, kind of domain knowledge signal here, which is saying, you know, if there's a spouse word between the two names, then it's probably talking about a marriage relation. So I think one way of eliminating labeling functions by looking at the conflict column is to see if one of the labeling functions has zero conflicts. Maybe look into it and see if you can make it a little broader to allow it to have conflicts with some labeling functions. Then the third point is sometimes while you're writing labeling functions, you might end up writing a really complex one or you end up repeating your labeling functions and they seem to encode the same information. So I'll start off with the example here. So you have one labeling function that looks for the spouse words between the two names of the people in a sentence. Then you have another labeling function that looks for the same spouse words, but now to the left of um, the second person's name. So you might think these are kind of doing the same thing. They're basically looking for a spouse word in that sentence. So why don't we combine them? But I think splitting them up kind of talks about two very different sentence structures, right? If the word, if a spouse word is between two tokens, that might have a very certain connotation versus if it's, you know, kind of outside the two names, then it has to be close enough to the two names to actually matter. So that's encoded here when you say window equals two and getting your left token of the first and second one. So you're looking within two uh, words of the people's names. So you could combine them and you could kind of leave them as is. That's something you should play around with. Um, you can try to see if going broader and maybe lowering the accuracy helps or maybe splitting it and then giving the generative model more information by splitting it into different labeling functions is a better idea. So finally, we get to this idea of you know, high coverage versus high accuracy. So this is something that I mentioned a little bit before. So you have these distance supervision labeling functions, which have kind of low coverage. But if you look at the empirical accuracy, especially of the first one, that's really high. And that's expected, right? Because with distance supervision, you're looking at a knowledge base that already has encoded names for people who are married. So it kind of looks for the same names and they're like, oh, if they appear together, there's probably proof in this sentence that they're married. So that makes sense. But its coverage is low. And then you, we go back to our kind of favorite uh, labeling function here with the really high coverage, um, which looks at all the negatives, right? That's also encoding some important domain information, saying that if the spouse word doesn't appear in a sentence, it's probably um, a false kind of uh, indicator. But now what we want to highlight is both of these are really important for the generative model. This gives it a really strong signal about the negatives, while this one gives it a really strong signal about the positives. But if you only looked at like coverage or accuracy, you would think that this one is so much better than this one. But again, it's important to keep in mind that you need to balance both the negatives and positives. And in some cases, labeling the negatives is much easier than labeling the positives, in which case you'll end up with labeling functions like this, which are really high coverage for negative examples, and a bunch of other labeling functions for the positive cases, which have really low coverage individually, but together they give you a lot of signal about which positive examples exist. Yeah? Um, so if the data set that you, end, like the one that you really want to apply the model, yeah. if in that data set the positives are much less common, right. does that factor into the sort of weight that you give the labeling function? 
Right, so that's a great question. Even in the spouse examples, that was the case. The positives were definitely uh, lower in proportion to the negatives. In terms of learning their accuracies, the model can take into account class balance. So once you have that, you know, you can encode it. Maybe you use the same class balance as exists in your small label data set. So it will take into account the class balance when learning accuracies and applying your final labels. But do you factor that into like which type of labeling function you is yeah. Heavily, or does it not matter? So that depends in practice. I think when I usually work with this, these like class imbalance scenarios, what I find is for say you have fewer positives than negatives, I can get away with maybe two uh, labeling functions for the negative case just because they're fairly broad. But for the positive case, I have to develop maybe five to ten very low coverage, but many labeling functions. So you're having to have more for the yeah, because I think the rare one, um, it doesn't have like a general pattern you can use to identify all of them, which is why you have to use like a bunch of really specific patterns to cover them. I've also seen cases uh, where, you know, the positives are rare, like you said, but they follow a very specific pattern. Um, and in those cases, you know, maybe you can get away with fewer. But I think for um, the spouse example, we had we definitely had like a bunch of these labeling functions that looked at the positive case like the husband wife and then splitting it into husband wife left window then looking at the same last name so you kind of there it just seemed like everything that was positive was like an edge case that you had to write a new labeling function so for it's more about like the homogeneity of the class yeah. rather than the okay. yeah that's exactly right so uh definitely one of my intuitions when talking yeah. about coverage is well, I want to see how good my coverage of all of the rules together are, mm -hmm. or the subclass of the rules. Mm -hmm. um, is there an easy way to do that other than just creating one big compound rule that has all the rules underneath? Right. Is that even the right intuition? I think so. When you look at the generative model score, once you've trained the generative model, that can print out for you kind of what the overall coverage was. So you don't have to kind of combine all the rules together manually to see that. And that will also tell you kind of what the overall quality was. So I think that is the right um, kind of metric to look at after a few iterations of labeling functions. Because I think initially um, it's better to kind of try and get all your domain knowledge into these programmatic labeling functions, see if you're getting high enough accuracy for some of them, and then once you have that, that means you have sort of like a good base, and then you can try and increase coverage. So this kind of second point there is that these labeling functions never label all the data. They're always going to have fairly low coverage, and that's why we have like the end discriminative model, or like say the LSTM, that'll help us generalize. So I think in my opinion, kind of focusing on quality and accuracy more than on coverage is always a better way to go at this stage. And, uh, yeah. Should we have a more uh, simple labeling function or few complex labeling functions? Oh, that's a great point. That's like exactly my next slide, so I'll get into that later. <laughs> Yeah, I, mean, yeah. I, have a, I have a probably very simple question. Like, I could see that like all the uh, labeling functions probably you already covered it before I came, but all the labeling functions either are trying to find true positives mm -hmm. and true negatives or true like false and negatives. <coughs> and false right, negatives. right. So does it mean like for example the last name? Mm -hmm. It never went wrong in uh, finding negatives. Ah. We like yeah. I mean, it's really hard to. Right, no, that's, that is a great question, and that's something that was very specific to the way we wrote labeling functions here. So in this case, what we did was every labeling function, it either assigned a label of, say, negative or positive, or it abstained. So there's no labeling function that actually labels both negative and positive. It's, they're all unipolar, that's what we call them. You don't have to make them unipolar, um, but I think making them unipolar helped us kind of understand here a little bit more kind of how the labeling functions we're doing. Again, going back to the class imbalance case, making them unipolar gives you a better understanding of how it's kind of focusing on the negatives and focusing on the positives. For class balanced cases, I've usually combined them. So I have the same labeling function doing positive, negative, and zeros. And it works the same way in terms of learning accuracies, um, but it's just, it's okay because it's cost balance, so I know that the accuracy will give me a good sense of it. Yeah. So is there any benefit to running error analysis on the individual uh, 
function there from that time. And what do you mean by running error analysis on the so individual ones? So it gives you a score, uh, the positive, negative, position we call an F1. Mm -hmm. The true positive, false positive, <coughs> and an F1. So that whole thing. Uh, instead of running this, or in addition to running this, right. as you develop your uh, labeling function, is there any benefit to having those? And if so, you know, what statistics can you get out of that? That's a good point, and I think there's definitely benefit to looking at the individual labeling functions. I think that's probably the second part of your labeling function refinement stage. Again, it's better to kind of get all the labeling functions written down, uh, go through the model, see how it's doing, and then you can do error analysis on specific ones that you know you thought should have done better, and you know they should encode better information. There's also um, a candidate viewer in the snorkel um, repo that you can look at, so it highlights kind of which candidates your labeling function got wrong and your generative model got wrong, maybe you can use that to kind of get signal of how to better write your labeling functions. But I think it's the second stage. Yeah? So I keep on adding some labeling functions for the positive data set. Right. How will I know that I'm balancing, like negative and the positive? Right. Is it based on coverage and exactly how will I know? I think the best way to know whether, you know, when you're writing these new labeling functions, is it helping, you know, are you keeping the balance of negative and positive or not, is to look at the final generative model score. So the final generative model, um, if I go back to what it prints out, if you see here, it kind of prints out true positive, false positive, true negative, false negative. So you can use your positive negative class accuracy and these counts themselves to see whether when you've developed these new labeling functions, are you actually increasing the number of positives? Are you somehow hurting the number of negatives? So I think in this case, looking at the overall generative model score should help you figure out if you're keeping that balance or not. OK, so now to get to the question about you know, having one complex labeling function versus having several uh, simpler labeling functions. So let's say we had, um, you know, we have two labeling functions, one that looks at, you know, the names are too far apart, and an another one that looks at whether the word married appears or not. So maybe we can combine them and say, you know, they're married and they're too far apart or something, like, and they're not far apart, so it is true. That's one way of doing it. So now you've taken two really simple labeling functions and combined them. So in that very simple case where you just to take two existing ones and combine them, your coverage is going to drop, right? Because now you've done kind of an and between two binary signals. Another thing is that its labeling pattern will kind of match the other two labeling functions labeling pattern, right? Because there's some sort of dependency here. But the generative model can actually pick up these dependencies. I think Jason talked about that yesterday. So even if it's doing that, if we didn't account for dependencies, this might not be a good labeling function to write because you're kind of confusing the generative model. But because we can pick up dependencies, it'll know, it'll basically figure out that, oh yeah, this labeling function is only a combination of the other two. So in that case, you know, you can go ahead and add it, see how your generative model does. Sometimes it hurts it, sometimes it helps. I was trying to print out you know, kind of what happened with this labeling function. And I made three complex ones like this, and there was no consistency between how much it helped or not. So again, it's very dependent on your data, dependent on which labeling functions you um, join together. So you, sh you, ha you just have to try it to see how it does. In this case, it's pretty easy, right? Because you don't have to like use new domain knowledge or anything. You're just taking two existing ones and combining them. The second way, I think, is taking one of those complex labeling functions and splitting it. I think this helps. In the three cases I tried it yesterday on the spouse data set, it did help. Again, this is not a blanket statement of it'll, if it'll always help or not. So I think this was um, looking at whether a spouse word exists or not. And then I just split it into you know, looking at the first token and then looking at the second token. Maybe, maybe that encodes different sentence structure. Maybe it adds more conflict. I don't know what it is, but there is something about splitting a more complex labeling function that gives your um, generative model more signal. I think it also helps when you're looking at kind of every individual labeling function and looking at its like coverage and its conflicts. It kind of helps you see how each one is doing independently. I would always aim for simpler labeling functions and then combining them in this manner rather than you know, combining a really long nested if-then statement within one labeling function. 
So this is all I had for the labeling function specific tips. I was going to move on to um, looking at kind of what other things we're looking into and we're thinking of adding to the snorkel system to help, but I'll pause here if you have any questions. Okay, so the first thing we have, this this is not snorkel, this is just looking at a different data set, is kind of visualizing how these different uh, labeling functions interact. You know, we just went over how these overlaps and conflicts are really important. So if there's a way of kind of looking at some clusters that we're labeling well, some clusters that we're not labeling well, and putting that into the snorkel system. So other than just scrolling through the candidate viewer, you also have a more kind of visual approach of debugging your labeling functions. So that's definitely one of the things we're working on. We, one of our collaborators had like a prototype system here, I think a few months ago, and then I don't know what happened. But I know that there was some work done on this sense. We also have ways of kind of visualizing the conflict matrix and visualizing the overlap matrix. So again, you get more of a visual sense of how your labeling functions are interacting. So another thing that we worked on was kind of looking at how we can help generate these labeling functions automatically using just the label dev set that we have. So one warning is that this was definitely aimed towards the non-text kind of models because when you don't have text data, you have kind of image data or video data all the features you write your labeling functions over are numerical. And then, you know, in addition to encoding domain knowledge, you have this extra layer of guessing these thresholds. Like, you know, let's say we're writing a labeling function based on the area of something, right? It can be like a bike, it can be a tumor in the medical case, but you have to say area greater than 10 or area greater than 10.5. So that becomes, you know, an added layer of kind of refining and tuning your labeling functions. So that's something that we wanted to get rid of and try and automate that process using just the small label dev set. With text, we definitely tried it. I think for text cases, this works well if you have sort of a good feature set for your um, data to start with, because then it can just use those features and automatically create labeling functions, it sort of optimizes for coverage and accuracy automatically. If you sort of use just like a bag of words model, it's not going to do that great because it can't write things as complex as um, like users write. It would just say, if the word marriage is in the sentence, true. If the word marriage is not in the sentence, false. And then that's kind of the complexity that it can handle. Um, but if you do have a richer feature set, maybe you um, have features that have been outputted from regex rules, then it could be interesting to use. Another one, which I think is really exciting is um, looking at natural language as a way of writing labeling functions. So with this project, what we tried to do was we said that a lot of people, you know, writing Python and converting sort of their domain knowledge to Python can be kind of the longest bottleneck or like the most painful bottleneck. So we wanted to see if we can just take natural language explanations for why a certain label should be assigned or not and then use that and automatically convert it to labeling functions, run it through snorkel, and then just give you labels at the end. So the way we went about um, doing this is we went on Amazon Mechanical Turk and we said, you know, it was again the same spouse example, and we said, why did you label this particular sentence true or false? So they gave us reasons like we said true because the word married appears in the sentence, or we said false because the word sister appears two words away from the second uh, person's name. So what we did was we collected many of these explanations. I'm trying to think how many. Um, I think for the spouse case, we ended up with maybe like 50 or 60 uh, high quality explanations. And once we converted them to labeling functions, these had fairly low coverage because they were very specific, right? But we did end up with a large number of labeling functions and we were able to match sort of the quality of what users would write. It, in a more complex case, I think we were doing uh, whether a chemical causes a disease or not. In that case, you know, we saw that 30 explanations were good enough to match 600 hand-labeled examples in terms of end model performance. So you can see that the code is up on that website. Um, you can try it. There's a nice tutorial with the, snor uh, with the spouse data set. So you can look at you know, what explanations people wrote, what kind of labeling functions they were converted to. So I think this, this is probably one of my favorite projects. It's really cool. Um, and then we have some stuff that's coming soon. So this is now looking more at 
how once you've written the labeling functions, how can we kind of extract more information from it? So one thing that we noticed is that sometimes you write labeling functions, they're really accurate on one subset of the data and really bad on another subset. So what happens is your generative model just ends up learning a really you know, mediocre accuracy for that labeling function. So what we want to do is we want to find those subsets automatically. So I'll try walking through this example. So what we were trying to do here is we were trying to use sort of the text associated with the images to determine if the picture is of a car or a plane. Um, so we say if the word fly is in um, the caption, it's probably a plane. If it's drive, it's probably a car. And if it's cruise, it's probably a plane. But that's not true, right? Sometimes people use the word cruise with cars as well. So now we want to basically take that labeling function cruise and kind of split it into two different forms. One when it's probably a plane and one when it's probably a car. So what we did was we said, oh, you know, if the image associated with the um, caption, if it's like more blue than green, it's probably a plane. So it's like a really simple toy example, but that kind of helped us split that cruise function into two and know that when you're talking about a plane and when you know the background is more blue, it has really high accuracy. It's like 90%. But when the background is not blue, it's probably not that accurate. You know, it's probably a car there, and this is labeling it a plane, so we should ignore it. And I think we're trying to look at how we can kind of build more things like this, where you write the labeling functions as you would, but kind of behind the scenes, we take care of more complex ideas and to eventually generate more high quality training labels. Thank you. Thank you.